this article is really bulked using a recent um, incident, which is these um, 150 Australians of Lebanese descent joining jihadists fighting in Iraq and Syria to basically wage an attack on accepting Muslim immigrants. His call to action is pretty much down the bottom, which is pretty much to restrict Muslim immigration. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. So, who let these jihadists into our country? Must we run this danger just to boast our immigration system isn't racist? So, again, the who let these jihadists into our country sounds it's kind of like an attack, an accusation. But this one, the second question is slightly more rhetorical because the reader would be very likely to disagree with um, allowing jihadists into the country so that we say we're less racist. They would think that that sounds a bit outrageous and would be likely to oppose that. We will always have a non-discriminatory immigration policy, Prime Minister Tony Abbott declared three years ago. Admirable in principle, how wise in this age of terror. So age of terror is quite emotive, okay? It's an appeal to fear. So we're meant to feel like we are in very vulnerable times. So here he starts to um, address what the incident is that he is referring to. Having these very short fragmented sentences, consider, full stop, has a moment of pause where the readers are encouraged to stop and think for a moment and consider. Um, mentioning that Khaled Sharouf lived on a disability pension in Sydney, this fact raises um, extra outrage because there's obviously prejudice in society towards, um, you know, people who are unemployed or living off benefits. And to couple that with this notion of, well, he's fit enough to go and fight a war, why is he on a disability pension, will make the readers feel very angry, especially um, if they're taxpayers. And they said that here he's waving the flag of the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. Now, this is, you'll see later the, the acronym ISIS, and that's what it stands for, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. And they're an unrecognized state and an active jihadist militant group um, who basically believe in turning um, governments and states into uh, governments which follow Islamic law. So their wars are religious wars in the hope that they want to um, change governments to being Islamic. Um, and yeah, shooting and beheading countless unarmed Shia Iraqis. So this notion of not only shooting but also beheading this word um, has particular connotations for the reader as beheading seems really primitive. It's one thing to shoot somebody, but another thing to cut off their head. It almost seems medieval. So we see or start to feel that this group is very backward. Um, they're not like your normal militants. We start to feel that they're, they're bloodthirsty and they actually enjoy in the killing so much that they take the time to remove the heads. Okay mention of a Facebook photo of somebody posing with a gun next to slaughtered Iraqi civ civilians. Now normally people post on Facebook things that they're proud of, things that they want to share. So again it makes us feel very angry about these jihadists because it seems like they're proud of their killings. Um, we feel very disgusted by that. Now saying as well, emphasizing that it's an Australian jihadist, makes us start to feel fear again by thinking why is it that um, these sort of uh, people who are fighting these these jihads, these religious wars, 
are Australians as well. So we start to feel like they're neighbours, they're living in our own community. Okay. Again, the continual mention of social media like Instagram, Twitter and Facebook is intended to, uh, well, when we think of social media, we think of things that are viral, you know, and it seems like that this message is spreading and maybe has the potential to spread rapidly. These examples down here continue to give examples that are supposed to be evidence of this spread. Um, you know, things happening in Sydney and Perth, so we start to think this is nationwide. Okay. Mentioning specific names gives Bolt a sense of credibility that he's sort of done his research and he knows the major players in this issue and who said what. Now, Bolt sometimes does this, has these short phrases that's made, meant to make him seem less biased. You know, it's important to stress most Muslims are peaceful. Um, so that's meant to kind of quiet and tone down his peace so that we don't feel that he's a complete bigot. And when we say bigot, we mean... Well, that's really helpful. Um, somebody who's, you know, like kind of extremely prejudiced. So... But in the same time, he'll say things like that, but then go on and pretty much put forward a fairly bigoted contention, like restricting Muslim immigration. So on the one, but anyway, that, that's criticizing Bolt. That's not looking at how you know he's setting forward to persuade. But just remember that when you analyze someone being persuasive, that doesn't mean that you necessarily agree with what they're saying, but you're trying to become more wary of how they're trying to put their view across. Okay, so it says the here that Muslim immigration has exposed Australians to a level of danger, including extraordinary gun crime in Western Sydney, that immigration from India, Europe and China has not. Now, this could be perceived as a generalisation by saying exposed Australians sort of in general. Um, and there aren't a lot of specifics, like extraordinary gun crime is also quite generalised. Um, he hasn't mentioned any specific incidents or any specific facts or numbers. So remember, generalising in this way just gives the readers a general feel that this is a big problem, but without giving sort of real evidence. Okay, notice the juxtaposition or the description of multicultural Australia here as weak. Um, in one of the previous articles that I analysed for a student um, not long ago, also written by Bold that you'll be able to find on this channel, um, you know, he was talking about the whole Muslim phenomenon phenomena as white anting Australia's culture, which is kind of destroying Australia's culture from the inside. So he's continuing in his articles to push forward this idea that multicultural Australia is weak and will crumble and be dominated by um, barbarian terrorist groups. Okay. Based on this sort of evidence he gets up here, and so what he's trying to do here is put forward some kind of facts and statistics to um, support his point of view that the second generation immigrants are even more radical than the immigrant parent. Um, so what he's suggesting there is that um, it's very difficult, according to Bolt, to screen out the radical Muslims because it's not the new immigrants that's the problem, it's often their children that's the problem. And this is a, an accusation that Bolt is trying to make and support using the facts and figures that he's chosen up here. Then he labels his inclusion as irresistible, which I guess his way of sort of saying that you can't argue against it. Um, the more Muslim immigrants we admit, 
the more terrorists we risk one day having. And there's a bit of uh, repetition here, the more and the more, because he's trying to create a direct link between the Muslim immigration and the terrorism in the reader's minds. Okay. It's interesting here that he refers to... Um, you know, migrants in groups as colonies. Now, colonies uh, can be used for, you know, national groups like, you know, British colonies and that sort of thing. Um, but they can also be used to describe insects as well. Um, and sometimes Bolt tends to use sort of parasitic or parasite references in his writing like the white ants from the previous article to start to subtly ingrain this this image or this connotation in the reader's minds of them being unpleasant parasites or insects. Okay, here obviously quoting Judge Anthony Wheely, so using an authority that we're more likely to um, listen to. And again, with all this reference, again, to social media, smart media, that kinds of things, um, you know, Bolt wants us to believe that this issue has gotten worse because of the rise in technology, cable television and things like that. <laughs> so he says again, again, most Muslims mean only peace. That's Bolt's sort of attempt again to sound like he's, he's not completely bigoted and, um, you know, we, we need to see him, he wants us to see him as kind of a reasonable sort of guy. And even though he sees reasonable, again, he uses a quote from somebody who's, um, who's quite respectable um, and high up. So he's like, oh, most of them mean any peace, but the head of New South Wales counter-terrorism squad criticized. So trying to make him seem reasonable and like all he's doing is trying to report the facts from well-known sources. And then we come down to his, uh, you know, an open-ended question to get us to ponder what should we do? And that's when he brings in his call to action, which is that rather than just detaining these returning jihadists, we need to restrict Muslim immigration. And over here, this relates back to the title, this end part. This holy war cry is a wake up call. So he's suggesting here that the war cry is pretty much against us. Because he says here, if Islamic leaders can't stamp out jihadism, we may have to defend ourselves as best as we can. So it goes from talking about this, you know, war of um, and the participation of the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria um, to kind of turning it around to suggest that it's actually a war against Australians and um, undermining uh, Australian values and multicultural Australia. Uh, yes. And that is that.